This week, MPT is focusing on the War of 1812 Bicentennial. A star-spangled celebration will feature tall ships, naval vessels, and a Blue Angels air show at Baltimore's Inner Harbor. And all of that kicks off on Wednesday. That night, from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock, we will bring it all to you live right here on MPT as an official broadcast partner. Tonight, we begin by going aboard a Navy destroyer. Originally, these ships were designed during the Cold War. By the time the first Arleigh Burke class destroyer rolled off the assembly line, so to speak, uh, the Cold War was over. Uh, and yet here we are 20 years later, the, uh, the ships are still very versatile and very relevant in today's world. It can go anywhere. It will be forward deployed for months at a time, typically six to seven months. That's getting extended now because of the changing mission needs. It wouldn't be uncommon to go out with a carrier strike group or an expeditionary strike group and provide key support role for anti-air or uh, anti-surface warfare at the time. The Arleigh Burke class destroyer is a guided missile destroyer. We are a multi-mission platform. We do anti-air, anti-surface, anti-submarine, and uh, strike. We have, uh, as you can see behind us, we have the five-inch gun, and we also carry different missiles, standard missile, tomahawks, uh, harpoons, and um, torpedoes. We are able to do things off the coast of the United States to make sure that home is safe. And then we also deploy over to 5th, 6th, and 7th fleets to maintain freedoms over there as well. I'm a GSMC Aaron R. Vaughn. I'm in charge of both engine rooms on board the ship and the fuel testing lab. I was on board the USS Donald Cook for four, four years. I commissioned it in 1998. Uh, it's one of the finest water, uh, ships on the waterfront today. I was on board when the coal was uh, attacked in Aden, Yemen in 2000. Uh, we were one of the first responders. Uh, the, the, a lot of the Cook sailors went on board, slept on board, uh, and, and aided the coal in its rescue and, uh, and salvage operations. This crew is no different than any other crew on any other ship. They love what they do, and once you get them talking about their job, you can see the pride that they have in, in what they're doing. They know that their little part of the puzzle is part that makes the whole Navy complete. U.S. Navy port visits in U.S. Navy cities are getting rarer and rarer. If you have the opportunity to come out and see a naval vessel in your hometown, come out and see it. People on board that ship are going to be as proud of that ship as you will be to show the sailors a good time in your city later that day. And joining us in the studio now is Captain Jerry Hendricks, director of the Naval History and Heritage Command. Captain, thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure to be here. We want to talk naval history, but let's pick up on that point, an opportunity for people to come aboard a naval vessel. Um, why should people take advantage of that? Well, uh, for, for the first thing, it is their Navy. Uh, these ships are purchased by the taxpayers. Uh, they're provided to provide for the common defense of our republic. Uh, they are the epitome of the highest levels of technolo technology that exists in the world. Uh, they're exemplar of the, the latest that we have that we invest in protecting our nation and the American people. So if you have the opportunity to come out to see these, these magnificent vessels, then do come. But I think the most important thing that the American people will want to do is meet the sailors that man these ships. And these are incredible young men and women, uh, incredible crews uh, staffed by some of the finest officers we have uh, and the enlisted folks that are on board who are specialists in various areas of technology. You really want to come and meet these people because they are exemplar of the very best that our country produces. What should someone expect on a ship visit? a lot of wow. They're going to come on board, they're going to see uh, the technology that's there, they're going to walk around, uh, they're going to see you know, examples of, uh, of the missiles, they're going to see aircraft hangars, they're going to see the guns that are, uh, the five inch guns that are up on the main deck. They're going to get a chance uh, as they walk around, perhaps even to go into the combat information center and see the type of facility and how information is exchanged at the speed of light uh, with our Navy around the world. And so uh, having opportunity and kind of seeing that level of investment, I think they're going to walk away impressed by uh, what their tax dollars have brought to them. I don't know off the top of my head the total number of vessels. There's going to be a dozen or more tall ships. Mm -hmm. They get a lot of press. It's pretty pictures, yeah. uh, naval vessels from different countries. Mm -hmm. Would you suggest somebody, if they had a day to invest in this, maybe split your time a little bit? Well, I think so, because it's always majestic to see the tall ships. Uh, the 
Coast Guard Sailing Bark Eagle will be coming in later on this week. And, and she's the, one of the finest examples of, of a sailing vessel still in commission used to train Coast Guardsmen uh, out there on, the, on our nation's oceans or on the world's oceans. Uh, but also to go on board the most modern of the ships, uh, to see the Arleigh Burke class destroyers um, and, uh, and, and get a chance to walk around and, and see that technology and see those individuals. They're gonna enjoy that just as much. Uh, let's turn the clock back a little bit. The War of 1812 is something you've looked at from an academic standpoint mm -hmm. as well. Fair to say that it marked the, the dawn of U.S. naval power? Absolutely. Um, we had fought the American Revolution and we had had a small navy and we'd had some successes at that. But uh, after the American Revolution, of course, we had the, the Constitution comes into effect and we form our government. And very early on, we had a group of very forward-looking uh, politicians and statesmen who made investment in the latest in technology in the world. The six frigates that were laid down under the designs of Joshua Humphreys were, uh, again, the very best in the world. Uh, the USS Constitution, of course, is still with us today, but these ships were created out of live oak that was very difficult to harvest down in the southern United States, and yet we were able to shape this live oak into the hardest hulls in the world, and the ships were larger than most frigates, uh, and they were quicker than most ships that were larger than them, ships of the line that the British had out there. And so we found that we could either outgun ships of the same class or outrun ships that were larger than us. And so it was very at the very leading edge of technology, and that is a tradition that we've brought forward, this, tech, this tradition of ingenuity, of doing things differently uh, in the world. And, and quite frankly, you'll see that on the Arleigh Burke class destroyers. We saw some animation of uh, artist conception of what the Battle of Baltimore might have looked like in terms of armaments. Mm -hmm. When we see the tall ships, and I know the, they're different from the, the frigates of the day, um, they don't look that fearsome. What, what kind of force were they able to project? What sort of damage were they able to do? Well, when you consider that uh, Constitution, which is rated with 44 guns, uh, and they were 24-pound guns, which meant that the ball uh, was a 24-pound ball. And so at any given time, you would have 22 guns fire on one side for a throw weight of several hundred pounds coming at you at high velocity at very close range. It either had damage to the infrastructure and structure of the hull or that those cannonballs are perhaps even canister or grape, which is essentially a shotgun shell, if, we, if the, the cannons were stuffed with that, would come and mow down the crew. So it was a very dangerous environment. Before they would go into battle, they would spread the decks with sand in order to avoid slipping in the blood that would be spilled during the battles. And so it was a very grisly situation. But again, there was a tremendous amount of power that was discharged, and then the ships would reload. And the ship that won was generally the ship that could train its crew to be able to fire and reload in the midst of this hailstrom that was coming back and forth and then continued to beat into the other enemy. Our ships had an advantage because they were created of this live oak, which was a denser form of oak, that the enemy's cannonballs actually fired into our sides and then bounced off, which is how Constitution got her nickname, Old Ironsides. No, no iron in, in the no, sides? No iron at all. It was just the density of that oak and the way that we had built those ships. They were so tough, the cannonballs could not penetrate them. We were uh, severely outnumbered from a naval standpoint in the Battle of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, how did we prevail? Well, I think just by, uh, it, it actually is a tradition that goes back to the beginning of the Republic. We maintained presence. Uh, we just stayed there and continued to go toe to toe. We fought uh, smarter. We knew when to introduce ourselves into combat situations. We knew when to withdraw, but we were always there to fight another day. And most of our naval successes uh, during the War of 1812 were single ship actions. Um, USS Constitution versus Guerriere, Constitution versus Java, United States against, uh, against Macedonia. These were all single ship actions. We didn't have a major fleet action until Perry uh, fights on the Great Lakes, and that was actually a very small fleet. I saw that your um, academic uh, PhD dissertation was on Teddy Roosevelt, and that he had written a lot and had a great interest in the War of 1812, and it went into his thinking, how so? Well. Roosevelt writes his book, The Naval War of 1812, uh, in 1884 it comes out. So he's only 24 years old, and he writes a book which is still considered to be the classic reference on, on, the, on the subject of the Naval War. But that, his research into that convinces him that the Navy needs to invest in a modern Navy. 
And it's that thinking and the principles that he developed out of that that he brings into being first the assistant secretary of the Navy and then ultimately the president that builds the Great White Fleet and essentially launches the United States on what is the American century because it is the naval power that allows us to become a world power, a global power at that point in time. So really the War of 1812 is the beginning of two eras of the Navy, one in the beginning in 1812 to 1814 after which we emerge with a standing Navy after that, and then again when Roosevelt leverages the Naval War of 1812 to derive lessons that bring us into the 20th century. In the 21st century, how are those lessons uh, applied? I mean, so much has changed. Power is projected by drones and, and cruise missiles, and ships, even the biggest ships, can be terribly vulnerable at great distances. Well. The, the core principles that we found or that were, uh, uh, that came out during the War of 1812 continue. One, we have uh, a tradition of audaciousness. Uh, the United States Navy has always been inspired by the examples of Decatur uh, and Hull uh, during the War of 1812 when they, when they took these ships against a superior British force and won these great battles by sheer pluck and determination. And so that spirit continues to this day. The sense of ingenuity, the idea of taking technology uh, and, and utilizing it in a different way, of looking at problems in a, from a different perspective. Uh, that came out in the War of 1812, that continues to the day as we continue to look at the naval environment and you look at those unmanned technologies. And we simply looked, uh, one of the technologies we used is a Scan Eagle, which is an unmanned aerial vehicle. It was originally designed to hunt for tuna uh, out in the Pacific Ocean. And we looked at it and said, you know what, I can use that to look over the next hill. And then Scan Eagle became a major thing for, uh, for us to scan and extend the sensor range of our ships. Um, and also, you know, we are very much interested in our business community. The Navy then turned to the business community for support, both uh, to generate the materials that we needed to fight in the War of 1812, and so we, we deeply invested in the small business community here in Baltimore. We still uh, continue to have investments through the Office of Naval Research and so on, where we give grants to small business leaders that we're looking for the latest and newest ideas that we know are going to come from the American, uh, you know, businessman. You go to work every day at the Washington Navy Yard, yeah. which itself played a role in the War of 1812. Well, unfortunately, uh, a passive role. Yeah, a <laughs> passive role. That when the British invaded, the, the Navy Yard was burnt uh, on their way to the White House. Uh, but at the same time, we, we carry a great, great deal of tradition there. Uh, it was a place where a lot of ships were built. It was where the Washington Naval Gun Factory uh, churned out the large guns that went on our battleships for a number of years. It's a great place to work, and I enjoy walking through and having the sense of history that pervades the Washington Navy Yard. It's a, it's a nice part of my job. Well, thank you for coming up to Owings Mills. We appreciate it. Captain Hendricks of the Naval History and Heritage Command. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you.